happy to see you all here tonight for our Books and Coffee. And I think by now you might have received your solicitation for your Friends membership. And I just want to remind you how important that membership is to supporting these programs here at the college. So I hope you'll renew your membership if you are a member. And if you're not, I hope you'll consider joining us. And those forms are outside on the table. But tonight I am delighted to welcome Andrea Rayner to Concordia College. I enjoyed her first book, The Voice That Calls You Home, her compelling collection of essays reflecting on her experience as a hospin chaplain, cancer survivor, and chaplain at Ground Zero following 9-11. And I was completely captivated by her discussion at the Bronxville Library, so much so that when she stopped, I was like, oh, don't stop now, I want more. Um, and I wanted your next book. I was eager for it, and here we are tonight with the next book, and with Andrea to share it with us, so I'm very excited. It was published this spring by Howard Books of Simon & Schuster, Incognito, lost and found at Harvard Divinity School, has been hailed by reviewers as engaging, inspiring, insightful, honest, amusing, told with clarity, humor, and hope. I would add authentic to that long list of praise. I think this is Andrea's extraordinary gift. When trying to parse her Harvard experience down to its essence, she writes, the question was not how to decipher some esoteric concept, but rather how to live authentically, how to explore one's own faith tradition while respecting another's, how to engage in genuine dialogue while striving for intellectual integrity. This is the education she took from Harvard, and this is the gift she shares with the reader, so eloquently with the reader. And on to authenticity that is disarmingly honest, engaging, and inspiring. I not only believe her story, I believe in her. On this campus, where our mission is to nurture a diverse student body, in a Christ-centered, value-oriented liberal arts education for lives of service to church and community, Andrea's story gives us something to strive for, to engage and inspire our students to live authentically. Please join me in welcoming Andrea Rayner. Gosh, thank you so much. I'm so honored to be here, and thank you all for coming out. I know these evenings are precious and you could be in a million other places, so thank you so much for, for joining me this evening. Um, I'm gonna just do a little bit of talking and a little bit of reading and then hopefully um, a whole lot of question answering. Um, one of the first things that people asked me when the first book came out was, how did you decide to become a minister? And so that really began me thinking about um, my path and, and reviewing how I got to basically ground zero, how I got to hospice, how I got to become a United Methodist minister. And I think at some point in our lives, you know, maybe when we reach that, you know, say 50-ish point where I've passed now, um, you start to think about your path. How did I get here? What are the choices that I made? And if I had gone this way, I wouldn't have met this person. If I had gotten that dream job that I wanted, I wouldn't have gotten this one that was so meaningful. So part of my um, intention in writing the book was both looking at the choices I had made in my own life that sort of brought me to that perfect place. Because when you're, especially when you're young and in your 20s, as I was um, when I started divinity school at 22, it all seems like you're in the thick of the woods. Even if you feel a little bit of a beacon guiding you forward, I really had no idea where that would lead. Uh, when I started um, undergraduate at Denison University, I was completely intent on being a doctor. Absolutely intent on being a doctor. I wanted to be a doctor from the time I was little. My sister was in nursing school at that point. Um, you know, I figured the little sister, I'd finally surpassed her and become the doctor. And um, then I just met chemistry, which we really didn't get along too well at all. And uh, I realized that's not something that I was particularly good at. It was, I was forcing it, which put me in a, in a huge tailspin in college, uh, because this had been my dream. It's, it makes sense to me now, as a hospice chaplain, that I would be doing work in a medical setting because that's a setting that I always felt drawn to, as a setting that I, that I found compelling and that I was interested in, and I could handle the, um, the physical, visceral kind of blood and guts of medicine, that, that, uh, that was still something that drew me. So here I was, eventually, how many years later, um, doing spiritual work in a medical setting. 
So incognito is, is kind of setting the scene for all of that, and my hope is that as I share with you my story, it will make you think about your own stories. And what were the decisions that you made? How did you end up with this person or, or this career or, or living here in this part of the world? Because every choice has brought us here to this place. The mistakes we might have made, the successes, the moments of joy and the moments of sorrow have brought us here. And that's what I find interesting about a memoir. I've had people come up to me and say, when you told that story about being in college, I was immediately back to my junior year in college. And that, I love that. That's such a thrill for me if something that I have said sparks a memory in you. The other part about incognito actually was clarified for me by my own pastor um, in a sermon two weeks ago. And I'm not really making a plug for Asbury United Methodist Church, which is right in Crestwood, down the parkway, which is a great congregation. But he actually clarified for me this idea of incognito because he said, really, we're all about trying to figure out, can I be me with you? Can you be you with me? Because some part of our identity is always a little bit hidden. For me, as a young minister, I didn't feel completely comfortable in that role a lot of times. Uh, my first hospital visit when I was first ordained in 1987, I went to the hospital. I was all of 26 years old, and somebody thought I was a candy striper. <laughs> now, if you laugh, that means you're old enough to remember what a candy striper is, so you've totally given yourself away. But you know, I, I didn't feel completely comfortable in the role, and I felt like weird, like I didn't look like a minister. Does that mean I had to cut my hair or wear something different, or um, did I have to be somebody that I wasn't? So it has taken me a long time to adjust into that role. And now when people are, don't act surprised when I say I'm a minister, I'm so offended. <laughs> you know, I guess it's the good and the bad. It's the benefits of age and probably a feeling comfortable in my own skin. And I think that's, again, what it is about. Can we feel comfortable in our own skin as we go about the world? How much of ourselves do we want to reveal to other people? And do we have to be someone else? So it is about trying to live authentically. And there's something wonderful about being young. And um, I, I definitely took a lot of risks, good and bad, when I was in my 20s and in divinity school. Um, and there's something wonderful about being able to reflect back on those experiences. So um, I'd just like to share a few, um, a few readings with you, if that's OK. And then maybe we can talk some more and um, answer your questions. I thought I'd give you just a, little, um, just a little peek at what it was like for me. I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. I was one of six children. My family was very um, religious. We, I grew up in a United Methodist home. My family not only went to church, but we lived our faith. Uh, we never missed a Sunday. My kids really get off easy, let me tell you. Um, we did not miss a Sunday. And, um, and I went to college in Ohio, which again is a really friendly place to be. And all of a sudden, I land in Boston, in Cambridge. And I don't know if anyone here is from the Midwest, but when I arrived in Cambridge, I'd walk down the street and go, hi, 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 hi. And people would look at me like, what is she on? She's crazy. Even, hello, see, I'm doing it again. Even, even like, you know, the elderly people would just knock into me in the bus, and it, it was funny. I found it kind of funny. I felt like I was in a strange foreign country because there was something there was such a different culture. There's something wrong with me for being friendly. So I was what you could call like maybe a tad naive when I got to Boston and the big city. So I, this is within my first week. I, I had a very good friend who'd moved to the North End. Um, we had been uh, roommates in Vienna, actually, on a semester abroad. And she was living in the same city, which was great. I had just said goodbye to her. And I'd hopped on the T, which is you know, the subway in Boston, and this is what happened. I found a seat and surveyed the bouquet of passengers. There were college students engaged in loud, playful banter, and others with their heads in books. 
There were two elderly Asian women speaking in a language filled with diphthongs next to a Latino laborer who was staring straight ahead. Women in power suits with sizable shoulder pads and pencil skirts stood in sneakers, their colorful pumps tucked securely in totes, and someone I couldn't see was playing the clash on a tinny boombox that must have seen better days. We rattled along to rock the casbah, and should I stay or should I go, till I had to change trains at Park Street Station and board the red line toward Harvard Square. When the doors opened at the Charles Mass General stop, about a dozen more people pushed their way into the car. A clear-eyed but weary-looking pregnant woman awkwardly wedged past several standing passengers. I noticed her belly brushing up against them and imagined her baby but a few layers of skin and muscle away. Another month and people would be ooing and eyeing. But today, she was just another body taking up space. Instinctively, I hopped up to offer her my seat. Thanks, she mouthed with a little smile and a roll of her eyes, sighing gratefully as she took the load off of her feet. Just as the doors were about to close, I noticed a man still in the process of trying to board. He had one foot in the car and one on the station platform, and he was struggling with a ridiculous amount of luggage and random boxes. No one seemed to see him or to care. I felt like I was in some weird dream where I was the only person who could move. I quickly helped him shove the last few boxes onto the train just before the doors closed. He nodded his head, but never really met my eyes. Instead, he was frantically looking over his packages like a worried mother duck, as if counting to make sure they had all made it on board. Then I heard him give a curt little merci. Hmm. A Frenchman, interesting, I thought. A slight man with a rather large mustache who looked to be in his late 20s or early 30s. In some ways, I couldn't believe my eyes. He was the embodiment of a comical character out of a Peter Sellers movie. Because he had clearly forgotten about me, I took the liberty of observing him without apology. He was sweating profusely, occasionally dabbing at his forehead with a handkerchief a gesture that made him look like he had stepped from another century. It was obvious that he was sweating due to a combination of stress and the fact that he was wearing a rather heavy overcoat, most likely out of necessity, because he could not have carried one more thing. His, ours, his eyes darted anxiously bet between his belongings and the subway doors, and I wondered how he managed to lug all those boxes from wherever he had come from, Logan Airport, South Station, He's probably a graduate student, I thought, an intellectual who hadn't really thought this whole move to Cambridge thing through. Maybe he was the type of person who could understand quantum physics or who was working on the cure for cancer but could not find the glasses that were sitting on his head. There were so many different kinds of people in Cambridge, he was just one more anomaly. When we arrived at Harvard Square, I was not surprised to find that this was the Frenchman's stop. He began moving boxes off of the tee with the ferocity of one passing buckets of water at a raging fire. I joined his one-man assembly line. I couldn't stop myself. We grabbed the last of the boxes and the train continued on. I watched for a moment as its lights disappeared around a bend in the tunnel. Meanwhile, people walked around and passed us without missing a beat. Maybe they think we're together. Maybe he's invisible, an invisible Frenchman. Maybe no one can see him but me. I obviously knew this wasn't true, but I found the whole experience curious, absurd even. But feeling rather good about myself, I took a couple steps toward the stairs that led out of the subway and up onto the sunshine of Harvard Square. It had been a full day already. I'd seen my friend. I'd given up my seat for a pregnant woman. I'd helped a foreigner. Life was good. I took another step. Don't look back, I said to myself, but I couldn't resist the temptation. I was powerless. It was like trying to look away from an accident. I had to see how the Frenchman was managing, regardless of the consequences. Surely someone is going to meet him here on the platform. Standing about 10 yards away, I watched as he mopped his brow and rubbed his chin, clearly surveying the problem of how to move all his belongings up all those steps. He began stacking things in impossible piles and rearranging them again. It was like watching a stage act, an improvisation that was relying heavily on stereotypes. 
I was cast as the nice girl from Ohio, while he was the hapless French intellectual. OK, I sighed. I'm in. I'll play my part. Besides, I was still blissfully happy, still giddy about the life that was unfolding for me at Harvard. He didn't look up as I approached him on the platform. Where are you going, I asked in my most friendly tone. No answer. Do you need some help? Hesitating for a moment, he pulled a wrinkled piece of paper from the pocket of his trousers, and he held it up for me to read, but clearly not to touch. It contained a scribble address. I vaguely recognized the name of the street, but I wasn't sure how to get there. I was still trying to learn my way around. OK, I'm not sure where that is. Do you know? Nod. Would you like some help? Nod. OK. I offered cheerily, hoisting the largest, heaviest, most awkward box imaginable. It was covered with duct tape and a French airport sticker. As I shifted my grip, the man piled two smaller boxes on top of that, as if I were a pack animal. Then he loaded one onto a suitcase, which he was forced to carry because it had no wheels. He tucked the final box under his arm, and we staggered forth toward the light of the square like the Holy Family, determined to keep moving, but unsure of our final destination. Every few steps, one of the boxes would fall, and we would have to stop while he attempted to balance it again. I became aware of the passing glances of strangers who seemed mildly entertained by our procession. We looked ridiculous, part of a circus troupe that had gotten squeezed out of the clown car. All we needed was a funny honking horn and a couple of giant red noses. I was following him as best I could, but it was hard to see over the boxes, and the square was filled with people. We made a turn off the main street and went down a cobbled road. Then we retraced our steps. I was beginning to regret my, my offer of help. My arms were aching, and I, too, was starting to sweat. I asked to see the address again, a request that was promptly ignored. Somehow, improbably, we arrived in front of a garden apartment. The Frenchman pressed on without saying a word. An outer door led to a narrow, poorly lit hallway. I let the boxes slide to the floor while the man fiddled with the lock. I couldn't feel my arms. I was aware that my face was the color of a plum, and sweat trickled down my spine. I'd woken that morning to a beautiful September day, one of those days lodged magically between summer and fall. The air was warm but devoid of the blistering heat of August. It carried the faint hint of cooler nights, of gloved hands, and the rustle of falling leaves. I had chosen a long denim skirt, one that snapped all the way from the waist to the hem. It was straight cut with a high waist falling to my ankles. I wore it unsnapped to about my knees, accompanied by a short-sleeved black turtleneck sweater. The sweater was made of a synthetic material which didn't breathe very well, and which made me feel suddenly trapped by the heat. I hadn't intended on wearing it for heavy lifting, just as I hadn't intended on schlepping some stranger's belongings all over Harvard Square in my $5 slippers. I leaned against the wall, waiting for him to get the door open and praying that we were in the right place. Voila! Thank God it opened. He straddled the doorway as resumed a version of our bucket brigade, shoving the boxes and the suitcase just inside the apartment. I noticed that he seemed oddly in no less of a hurry than he had on the subway platform, even though no train was coming. Once everything had safely crossed the threshold, I stood up and exhaled with a relieved and triumphant smile. I expected him to smile, too, in a, phew, we did it kind of way. But almost immediately, without saying a word, without raising his head or looking at me, he quickly squeezed through the door himself as if he were his own last parcel and promptly shut it in my face. Then I heard the lock turn on the other side of the door. <laughs> that was this Ohio girl's introduction to <laughs> being a good neighbor in Cambridge. But as I re began to reflect on that, which was actually, I laughed all the way back to um, the Divinity School dorm, actually. And I thought, this is a lesson. Am I acting because I'm trying to be good or prove that I'm a good person? Or do we act because that is what we're here to do? do we, is compassion its own reward? Do I act because I think this man is going to say, oh, thank you, thank you? So I took it as a lesson because at that point in my life, I was 
so open to receiving all of those lessons that were coming. And I thought this was just your quintessential Zen slap. So I was laughing. And as it turned out, because of that, because of the hour or so I spent carrying this man's boxes all over Harvard Square, I ended up meeting someone very important to me. And that's, again, some of the things that we reflect on. So, you know, the people that we meet, the relationships that we have, all contribute to hopefully finding that person that you do want to spend um, your life with or a significant amount of time with. But every, every one of our experiences brings us to that moment. So I'll just read you a little bit what happened afterwards. I made my way back to the center of Harvard Square and the open-air tables in front of Aubon Penn where old men were perpetually engaged in serious chess games against any worthy opponent, some of whom looked homeless, while punk rockers hung out around the entrance to the tee. One guy's giant sp spiked mohawk seemed to defy gravity. It was as if he was wearing a helmet with a dozen pointy blue spears. He lounged casually against a newsstand in his skinny black jeans and unlaced combat boots, smoking a cigarette and tossing his head back when he exhaled. Next to him were a couple of girls sitting cross-legged on the ground. They were dressed in black torn tights adorned with safety pins and sleeveless t-shirts. Wearing fingerless gloves, silver chains, and leather chokers, one had hair the color of a pink flamingo, while the others was jet black and shaved on one side. Near the corner, a guy was channeling Coltrane, playing a jazzy rendition of my favorite things on the saxophone, his case open to catch the change thrown his way. Stepping from the square into Harvard Yard through the Johnston Gate was like passing through an invisible barrier into another world. It was a transition that I always found profoundly striking. The air seemed cooler, shaded as it was by dignified trees and by the stately brick buildings that lined the yard, and anything outside the gates became almost instantly muted, as if Widener Library itself was whispering, hush. The faint st strains of the saxophone and the chaos of the square were soon swallowed up, absorbed and rendered silent like a drop of water in the ocean. About the time I emerged from the yard near the science center, I felt someone's gaze like the warmth of the sun on my cheek. Instinctually, I wanted to turn my head in the direction of that warmth. It was like being gently awakened from a dream, the dream of moving through Harvard Yard, the distant dream of the Frenchman, the dream of Andrea's apartment. Something silently, steadily caressed my face, summoning my gaze to the other side of the street with a gentle, magnetic pull. It took me a moment to register what I was seeing. The light obscured the details. Sunspots and shadows had to clear. Surfacing from the trance of my walking meditation, what reached me first were not the features of his face, but the expression. The closest thing that comes to mind is sheer delight. Someone was clearly delighting in the way that I was walking in my bare feet, swinging those shoes. I smiled back. We were walking parallel to one another on either side of a road that was beginning to converge. Everything that rises must converge, wrote Flannery O'Connor. We were rising, made buoyant by the moment and by the sheer joy of being alive, and we would converge. This is how I met Tomas. And then I'll, you'll have to read the rest of that one. So I'm going to make you suspenseful. So you kind of get the picture. This was um, the early 80s. Um, there was a lot happening at that time. Um, the punk rock movement was kind of in full swing. At any given moment in Harvard Square, you would see buskers. A, a very young Tracy Chapman would be playing in the doorway. I remember the first time that I passed and wondered who this amazing singer was. And it was Tracy Chapman, who was an undergraduate student at Tufts at that time. Um, there is, there's this magnetic pull about Harvard and Harvard Square to the point that there's actually a running joke about it, which is if, if you live in New York, really the question is, what do you do? If you live in Washington, D.C., the question is obviously, who do you know? At Harvard, it's, how long have you been here? Because no one really wants to leave, and, um, or else it takes so long to complete all the requirements for the various degrees. But it was really a, an amazing place to be. And just as an aside, I recently had a man who's a, um, a pastor in uh, South Carolina had written me and had gotten the book. And he said, you know, he had gone to St. Vladimir's here in, 
uh, here in Tucko, I guess it is. And he said, you know, I really loved it, but you know, that, your experience wasn't my experience at St. Vladimir's. You know, are you really, did this all, I, I am trusting that all of this really happened in Divinity School, but I can't quite believe it. And the first thing I said was, thank goodness I didn't write all of it because <laughs> the things that were omitted were um, probably the more difficult things to believe. And again, that incognito, how much of myself am I revealing to you? How much of you will you reveal to me? Um, I don't know, if this goes well, so if you guys all buy like five copies, I might write the real stuff, so yeah. <laughs> encourage your friends, encourage your friends. Um, one of the most profound experiences I had during my um, years in divinity school, and I do have a chapter of this in the first book, was the fact that I worked at a very large shelter for the homeless in Boston. It was primarily a men's shelter, um, but there was a small uh, wing for women. On, in the middle of the winter, there were 350 beds for men, there were 50 for women, but uh, the men would come streaming in in December, uh, January, February, and we might have another two or 300 sleeping on the floor at that time. I had to do, as part of my degree, a, um, two years of field placement. So uh, at that point, I had zero interest in becoming a minister. I really wanted to do work that was um, socially relevant, but from a spiritual perspective. And so when uh, th this field placement at the Pine Street Inn came up, I just, it just resonated with me. I knew that's what I should be doing. Um, they obviously needed more help on the men's side of the shelter. So again, as like a young woman, I was 22, I had to kind of take a deep breath and see if I could put myself in that space and just trust that that is where God was leading me. So I wanted to um, read you just a little bit of, of what it felt like to walk down the alley into the doors of Pine Street. Pine Street is still located in uh, the south end of Boston, and there was a long, narrow alleyway where the men would begin to line up because the doors wouldn't open until 3.30. It wasn't a day program. Some of the uh, older gentlemen could come in or if they needed some care, but mostly um, the men would line up uh, getting ready to, for those doors to open at 3.30. So by 3 o'clock, you'd have 100 men already lining the walls to, to come into the shelter because the, it was only the first 350 who got a ticket for a bed. And if you got a ticket for a bed, that also meant that you could get a shower, your clothes were put in a bin, and they were baked to kill any lice or bugs, and um, you, know, you, you were clean and relatively safe. If you didn't, weren't one of those first 350, you had to make do on the floor. We always served dinner there. There were a slew of volunteers from, from the area who would come in and serve. But this is what it felt that first day that I, I walked down the, alley, down the alley. My jeans suddenly felt too tight, and my legs like hollow branches filled with cold jelly, somehow stiff and rubbery at the same time as I walked down the alleyway that led toward the Pine Street Inn. Dick and I had finally connected on the phone, confirming that Pine Street and I were a good match. Now it was time to start my field education in earnest. What I hadn't considered was that it had been quiet there the day of my interview, an off time at the inn, when the only people inside besides staff members were the very old or those needing special help. Most of the guests were not allowed into the shelter until after 3.30 when the doors were unlocked. Because there were not enough beds to accommodate all who sought shelter, the lines would start forming hours before the doors opened. The first 300 to enter would get a ticket. The remaining two to 300 would have to make do on the floor. Although this wasn't the most comfortable accommodation for many of the guests, it struck me that no one was ever turned away. No one was told there is no room at the inn. The weary Josephs of Boston could always find a place to rest while the Marys were welcomed on the smaller women's side. I was scheduled to arrive at the men's side at 2.30, prime time for a full assortment of waiting guests. When I rounded the corner and looked down the alley, I reminded myself it will never be as hard as it is today. Sometimes a sense of calling gives us courage. Sometimes youthful optimism blinds us to danger. I had a little of both going on. I believed that I should be there, that this was where God was calling me, and my conviction helped me keep moving forward one wobbly step at a time. 
There were over 100 homeless men already lined up against the wall as I began walking what felt like the gauntlet of despair. The men ranged in age from 20 to 70 and were in various mental and physical conditions. Some were having animated conversations with themselves. Others were swaying to the groove of music that only they could hear, and still others had the bleary-eyed stare of the stoned or the intoxicated. Plenty of the guys just looked bored or hungry. I began my field work with that first step down the alley. Lesson number one, don't be scared, hold your head up, smile, but be confident. When I got to the door, I felt as if a thousand hands had passed over my body. It was strange. This feeling would dissipate over the course of my experience there. I either became less self-conscious or more confident or both. I didn't exactly become immune to the stairs or numb to the reality that I was one of the few women working there. But as time went on, I grew to know and love many of these men. They became individuals to me. They were not the homeless. They were Willie and Martin and Frank and Gerard. I knew their names. I knew their stories and tall tales. I cared about them as people and they cared about me. The less time I spent in my head and the more time I spent in my heart, the better things went. And as you can imagine, it was always a profound experience to go from the shelter, which at that point, there were no rules against smoking, and if you have 500 men chain smoking in a closed room, I would just come, I would just reek. I was like a walking pack of luckies. I really was. I just smelled. I was so self-conscious when I would get on the um, train to come home because I just reeked of smoke. But I would go from there and then back through those gates of Harvard Yard, which, you know, in a very short time, in about a half an hour, it took me to ride the T and get off at Harvard Square and start going through Harvard Yard. It, it was just so profound. And I felt so grateful to be welcomed into the lives of these men at Pine Street because I felt like I would have lost myself somewhere. That I really didn't know what I would find at Pine Street. And in essence, what I found was God. I found God at Pine Street. And that infused the rest of my studies. Because it was very easy in a place um, like Harvard, in a, in a very intellectual place, to leave the divine on the autopsy table. I mean, we could pick apart scripture, we could analyze different religious traditions. Um, in one class, you might have a rabbi um, discussing with an imam who's talking with a Buddhist monk in a saffron robe next to a very intellectual atheist, and that kind of dialogue was happening, but sometimes I lost my own sense of spirit. And I think that was the thing that my parents were most worried about when I um, came to the evil East Coast and went to that liberal bastion of Harvard Divinity School. So Pine Street um, grounded me. And I ended up working at Pine Street for all three years that I was there. I did the first year as a field placement. And after that, I just, I always worked a couple nights a week just to keep myself centered. And there's, there's um, quite a few little bits and pieces about Pine Street in the book. And if you read it, you'll probably see that these are the chapters that are closest to my heart and um, the, the times that I'm most grateful for. How are we doing on time? Okay, what does that mean? What? Quarter to eight. Okay. Unlike most of you here who don't go to Asbury United Methodist Church, you're, you're probably used to getting out on time. If, if that doesn't bother you, come to my church and uh, <laughs> you can be there all day. Um, okay, so it was not all serious, and I will just, um, I'll just give you a little tiny thumbnail and then a little conclusion. It was not all serious. I had a great time in Divinity School, and part of that is because I met my very best friend in Divinity School. We're still best friends. She lives in Vermont. She's a congregational minister. We talk every day, even if it's just a 10-second, you know, what's going on. Um, she happens to be the daughter of Frederick Beekner. Which, if any of you are read theological writings, is a very well known theological writer. She never made anything of that at all. But um, Catherine and I had a lot of adventures together. Uh, we're, we did each other's weddings, officiated at each other's weddings, were godmothers to each other's children, but it all began here. And we decided to take at least one practical course at Harvard. There weren't that many offered. So we took one practical course called Thinking and Doing the Sacraments. 
thinking and doing the sacraments. It was taught by a really wonderful uh, minister. And it was the only class that anyone who actually was going to be a minister, and there weren't many, in my, in my graduating class of about 100, maybe 10 people went on to become ordained uh, pastors. It's this tiny little percentage. So the sacraments class, we were going to um, learn how to do uh, weddings and funerals primarily, um, communion and, and baptism kind of secondarily, but weddings and funerals. And I'll read, the only slight problem was with this class was that there was a level of silliness that could not be ignored. There was something inherently funny, at least to Catherine and I, about putting on mock weddings and funerals in front of each other, although I'm not sure everyone felt this way. A few students performed their assignments without a hint of irony. For example, a woman who was in the process of becoming an Episcopal priest donned a red raincoat in lieu of vestments to officiate her pretend wedding. With an air of solemnity and a sweet southern accent, she led the acting bride and groom through a traditional wedding ceremony, one that was uninteresting but flawless. She was brave to go first, but that raincoat, well, it was hard to get past it without giggling. Catherine and I, of course, paired up for both the wedding and the funeral ceremonies. Inspired to do something different, we decided that our wedding ceremony would be a lesbian wedding. This may not sound so groundbreaking now, but in 1985, it was fairly risky. In the spirit of progressivism, we decided not to have a stand-in minister. The couple, played by us, would just officiate themselves. We put quite a bit of work into crafting the ceremony, writing our own vows, choosing Ruth 1, 16 to 17 as our scripture passage, where you go, I will go, and exchanging lines from an Adrian Rich poem, lines such as, I dreamed you were a poem, I say, a poem I wanted to show someone. At the end of the ceremony, we pronounced ourselves married, and we danced back down the aisle to the, to the talking head song, and she was. We felt quite elated by the experience, but the class responded with uncomfortable politeness. Stunned silence would probably be more accurate, come to think of it. Our teacher, Mick, nodded and smiled, but he looked a little dazed. It occurred to us only after the fact that many people in the class clearly thought that Catherine and I were a couple. Such was the obvious love between us. I found this rather funny, given the abundance of men in my life at that time and the fact that Catherine was also involved with a man. No one asked us, however, as we stood in front of the class ready to field questions. In some ways, it was the best wedding I've ever been a part of. It was creative, honest, artistic. In the years to come, whenever either of us was having man trouble, the other would say, just remember, you married me first. <laughs> so I'd like to just close with a, one last, last passage. I am still learning to stand like Martin Luther before the powers that be without apologizing for who I am. Sin boldly, he said, meaning take risks. If you're going to go out on a limb for what you believe in, go all out. Believe so passionately, so fearlessly that you are willing to be condemned as a heretic or a madwoman. Martin Luther faced death for his beliefs. Most of us face only shame and judgment when it comes to being honest about who we are. At the heart of things, I am still just a person who's trying to follow the nudges of the spirit, who feels living energy in every nook and cranny of our existence and seeks to share this reality with others, especially those who are suffering. This is what I was destined to do. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. So I would love if you had questions, and I believe we have a microphone so that we can, um, everyone can hear the questions. Uh, so. David, it's nice to see you. Yeah, thank you. Really, uh, you know, I was just curious as to what the Harvard Divinity School offered when, when you read the materials about it. Why you wanted to go there as opposed to say Yale or Princeton or another seminary. And also along that line, you mentioned 10 became preachers. The other 90% teacher, I was just curious what goes on there. Sure, and, and answering your first question, kind of why I chose Harvard, um, well, 
I would say that coming from my life experience and this this family with all these kids and you know parents who who just kind of barely made their way through college. My mom became a mom and kind of did an associate degree on the side. The idea of going to Harvard. Honestly, I thought my dad was going to hire a plane and write, my kid got into Harvard. I know, I know that's kind of hard to understand for those of you maybe who are from Bronxville and all of these kids go to these amazing Ivy League schools. But the high school that I went to, only 50% of the kids went to college. And I know that that has probably changed a little bit through the years. But I, I went to a high school that had a very uh, mixed demographic. There were enough AP classes for people who were motivated. Um, I went to Denison at that point. That was like a big deal in my family to go to Denison. But the idea of going to Harvard, honestly, when I told my parents, I called them on the phone to tell them I got in. And my mom said, how are we going to pay for it? And my dad, in total seriousness, said, we'll sell the house. <laughs> and that's the support that I had for my family. And if he had to, he would have. Luckily, in schools, this is a secret for uh, people who have kids who are applying, schools like Harvard are so well endowed that students like myself could go virtually, not exactly free, I mean I, I worked a good 25 hours a week or 30 hours a week all through school, but I, I um, was able to go on scholarship. And so that's part of it. The other part is that I had a professor at Denison who, um, when I was trying to figure out what I was going to do, I didn't become a religion major till the till my senior year at Denison. I, I was still in that science thing. And so um, I had a professor who said, you really, you need to go to, you should take the GREs and go to graduate school. And I was like, where? He said, well, you should go to Harvard. I'm like, well, yeah, okay, everybody should go to Harvard. And um, he said, no, this is a place for you. I said, I don't want to be a minister. He said, no, that's why it's a place for you. And so I applied to one graduate school. And um, which was actually more just, I, think, I don't think I believed it. So I, I just got that one application and even my application fee was waived. And he said, if you don't apply and it's free for you to go, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. So um, Harvard was appealing to me because it wasn't a seminary. Yale at that time um, was thought of as more of a seminary, more of a place that um, people who wanted to go into the ministry would attend. Princeton. I think was a little more of a seminary. It's not so much now. I think it's also more academic. But because I didn't want, I didn't want to be, I didn't want to become a minister. And all the ministers in my church all went to Asbury Seminary in um, outside Lexington, Kentucky. It's a great little seminary. But I, they all had the same viewpoint. So I went to Harvard for all those reasons. I think. And the other part of that. Oh, the other 90%. Um, the other percentage of people, some of them were doing joint law and divinity degrees, um, actually wanting to be ethical lawyers. <laughs> That's not an oxymoron for everybody. <laughs> and um, so they were, <laughs> sorry. And um, so you would fit right in there, David. Anyway, but, um, and some would, did say a joint um, medical ethics and divinity, and some were going to teach, and some were going to work for bread for the world, and some were going to seek um, social justice. So there was a mixture of people who wanted to be scholars and teachers and activists. And, um, and some of those, as it, like my friend Catherine, didn't become a minister until 10 years after we graduated, and then she decided to go that route. So maybe there are more, but slowly coming out of the woodwork. Other questions? Yes. And how many years later was it that you went into the hospice um, world? She asked, how many years was it between, um, say, uh, ordination? I grad. I, whoa, hey, now. I graduated in. Um, I graduated Harvard in 1986. It's with three-year master's degree, so it's a bit of a. It's a bit of a thing. Um, you have to write a thesis and the two years of field study. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do yet, so I. Um, I worked for a year doing protective services for the elderly. Um, I, I um, was the worker who went in when an elderly person was being abused or neglected in their own home. Always been attracted to really light, fluffy work, as you can see. Um, so I did protective services for a year, and then I was ordained in 1987, and I started working hospice in 1997. So in between there, I got married, I served a couple churches, um, I worked with the homeless in New York City at a day program for mentally ill homeless 
at, uh, through Columbia Community Services. And then in 1997, I had two little kids. My son was 17 months at that point. My daughter was about three and a half. And um, a, the local funeral director, Alan Benedict from Westchester Funeral Home, uh, I had met him because I was filling in a little bit at Lawrence Hospital, said, are you, are you thinking about going back to work? I said, well, you know, I'm not sure. And he said, because I think you'd be perfect for hospice. There's an opening at Janssen Hospice. They've been looking for a chaplain. And, you know, I think you'd be great. I didn't even know what hospice was at that point. I thought it was more like a Calvary, more of a place that you go. I didn't understand the whole workings of it. And I'm so indebted to Alan for uh, seeing something in me that then led me to this amazing work. So I've been hospice chaplain since 1997. Talk about that the shelter was grounding for you. Mm -hmm. but as a parent, I would think of my daughter, never mind Harvard, but the walking the streets late at night and then the shelter. Were your parents at all anxious? Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, I have to say this too. When I wrote the story of the Frenchman, I read it to my daughter, she's laughing, I said, don't you ever, ever, ever follow somebody to their apartment carrying a bunch of boxes, you know? <laughs> like when she went to college, I almost didn't want her to read the book, you know? At least she has a cell phone, you know, we had, remember, like, no cell phones, no anything. So, um, but yes, my, my dad actually came up to see me, and you know, I, like again, I was a little naive, I'm like, dad, come to the shelter with me, come, you know, meet my friends at the shelter, and he was just about to have a heart attack, honestly. I'm the youngest of the girls, and you know, I was bringing him to meet all my friends at the shelter, and he, he was very nervous, he was very nervous. There was a, a police officer stationed at the door every day um, because fights would break out. The guests were frisks, frisked at the door for weapons or alcohol. Occasionally things would get through. Um, and I had one protector, a really giant uh, young man, he was probably like 6'5 and 320, who would always insist on walking me to the T. And most normal people would not let a giant kind of mentally ill, homeless person, walk them to the tea at night. But the, even the officer said, you know what, I think you're safer with Derek than you are with me. So there were certain guys at the shelter who really um, took it, you know, it was their job to protect me. And, uh, and I think I just, I, I just was lucky. But yeah, my parents were, my dad said, I wish I hadn't seen that. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Angela. And, you know, that story about the punishment, uh, when I read it and then you, you read that section, you know, it, it really sort of irritated me that he treated you so badly. And then, of course, it's a good illustration for life of how things don't go according to how yeah. you think they may, right? When you give up yourself and you volunteer yeah. and you feel good about it and then you're disappointed. And I just thought you started to elaborate on that subject a little bit. I thought maybe you could talk a little bit more about how compassion works in your lives and others. That's such a good question. If anybody's getting anxious and they have to go, I don't mind, honestly. But just to give you a short thing about that, the real lesson for me, well, there are a couple. One was I was really patting myself on the back. I mean, you know, I gave up my seat. I helped this guy. And so in a way, not getting the gratitude, not getting him to pat me on the back because I was already doing it was such a great lesson. And I had to really examine my motives. I think it really came out of a genuine desire to help, and I was raised that way, and he needed help. But... Then when the door shut and the lock turned, I, I was horrified at first and mad. And by, by the time I got out of, the, out of his little hallway there, I just started to laugh. And I said, there's something for me to learn here. So I think it has, um, that experience really laid the groundwork to trying to feel a sense of compassion because that, that keeps me whole and that that keeps my spirit alive no matter whether what comes back or not doesn't really matter but if i have an opportunity to extend compassion I mean, for instance i just had a hospice patient um die this week who was not a very nice person i mean people are people you you die as you live if you have surrounded yourself with family chances are at the end of your life you'll you have your family there your friends he just was not a he was a bitter man he had some reason to be bitter and treated me horribly. And I realized, and I said to a friend of mine, if this had happened 10 years ago, I would get in my car and cry. But I could see him through the eyes of compassion. And for me, the Christian faith really infuses my own spirituality. So I thought, this person is still loved by God. 
in my, again, you know, everyone has their own spirituality, but I thought if he was the only person on the planet, Christ would have died for him. So who am I to sit here? I don't know his life. I know some of it. And so that not waiting for that return of gratitude has freed me up, I think. And that's, I felt very grateful for the experiences that I've had and how, and how many people I have been with so that I wasn't judgmental towards him or expecting to get confirmation that I was helping him. I think, I hope that answers. Yes. I want to ask you about parenting as a minister. How do, do you find that the same ethical values that you have, compassion, understanding, would be with to relate to people who are in need, do you find that this sort of organically develops in your children? I, I'm speaking about how do they react to you as a minister? Well, yeah, I have like two things to say about that. One, one very funny thing happened actually right here in Bronxville. We used to live in Mount Vernon. Um, I was very good friends with um, Reverend Bill Steele, who was at the Reformed Church forever. And one day, my son, who was a bit of a handful, he was about three and a half, not quite four, I had him in the bank when, I guess, I don't know if it's still a Chase Bank, they're by the station. He was so bad in the bank. I was like losing it. You know, he just was, he just was misbehaving. So I took him outside the bank. I'm squatting down. I'm giving him one of these like, listen, Alex, you know, I was really unhappy with him. So then Reverend Steele walks by and like, oh. I, you know, and so I kind of diffused it, and I said to my son, oh, you know, that's Reverend Steele, you know, he's the minister of the Reformed Church, and my son said, but mommy, men can't be ministers. <laughs> so that's one little n nugget. Um, the other is, I do think as a parent, by modeling um, these things, and, you know, my kids have, they've read my books, and when I was writing about the Ground Zero, which was so hard for people to write, and I would read them an essay, but when I finished it, they were like 10 and, and 13 at the time. They'd be sitting there with their milk and cookies going, that's a really good line, Mom. I like that. And it was hard. But I think it has implanted a seed of compassion in them. And it's one of the things, you know, here I am saying I'm not going to do that. One of the things that we can do by modeling compassion, because some of the things that have come back about my kids are, you have such, an ama you have such amazingly compassionate kids. My son's a you know, football player, he's a senior in high school, and yet he mentors an autistic boy in Rye who has, he has just multiple problems, and the mother is so grateful to him. Um, you know, my daughter, too. I think they just have that natural, because they've been, that's their model. I think, you know, we just assume the best in your kids, and even if they're acting out, eventually they'll come home to that, because it's in their DNA. Bless you. Yeah.